This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Parallel worlds, we all love them. Parallel worlds! But even with stories like Inferno and Rise of the Cybermen, Doctor Who never really delved into the storytelling potential of alternate timelines and parallel realities. However, this would all change in 2008, with the Series 4 episode Turn Left. Due to production logistics, two episodes in Series 4 would be missing a key cast member, Midnight barely featuring Catherine Tate's Donna, and Turn Left barely featuring David Tennant as the Doctor. When trying to come up with a storyline explaining the Doctor's absence, Russell T Davies was inspired by the film Sliding Doors, which was all about the consequences of a seemingly innocuous life event. Although, personally, Run Lola Run does that better, but that's a video for another time. Davies decided to take this idea to its logical extreme by posing the question, what if the Doctor died? This allowed him to develop Turn Left to be about Donna making a small decision that led to never meeting the Time Lord, resulting in a drastically different timeline, also creating a good reason to reintroduce Rose Tyler, who was locked in her own parallel world at the end of Series 2. Despite being made for a limited budget and reusing many existing shots from previous episodes, is Turn Left one of the most creative and fascinating Doctor Who episodes of all time? Who are you? I was at you. Then I took an arrow in the knee. Donna's entire life and the world itself changed because of one simple choice. And to tell the truth, yours could too if you join Skillshare today. I like to think I'm a pretty creative guy who likes to do creative things. But what if there was a place for people like me to take the next step in this creative journey? Oh, what, what's that time beetle? That's exactly what Skillshare does? Well, I'll be damned. Skillshare offers thousands of unique and inspiring classes from video editing to graphic design to creative writing and photography, along with so much more. Classes are hands-on, with short lessons tailored to fit any schedule, even if you're very busy like me. There are no ads to worry about and a reliable flow of premium Skillshare original classes, so you can always stay focused and inspired, regardless of what the year has in store. Skillshare lets you explore brand new skills or expand your knowledge, helping you achieve both personal and professional growth thanks to the support of a community filled with millions as you create real projects. I use Photoshop all the time, whether that be making my thumbnails or goofy little edits like this, but with a program like Photoshop, there is a lot to learn. So personally, I would recommend the Photoshop Essentials series by Meg Lewis, which serves as a great starting point for learning the basics. Even if you're experienced with Photoshop like I am, it's good for uncovering some new tips and tricks, so it's definitely worth checking out. You can access this class along with so many more by joining Skillshare for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, which is a great deal. And just between the two of us, if you go to the link in the description, you can get a free trial, but be quick because that only goes to the first 1,000 people to click the link. It's literally free, so you may as well try it out for yourself and see what Skillshare has to offer and explore your creativity today. So again, thank Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and let's get on with the review. Doctor Who always alludes to adventures off screen, whether that be some action packed escapade or simple visits to other times and alien worlds without much fanfare. Because, after all, who would want to travel with the Doctor if it was constant, intense action every single outing? It only makes sense that these characters would have innocent excursions, because with the time and space machine, there have to be some events that aren't thrilling enough to see on TV. This is the kind of thing we get a glimpse at at the beginning of Turn Left, with the Doctor and Donna exploring a market on an alien world, trying local delicacies and just having a great little time together. Although this would prove to be their last harmless trip together. It's quite similar to Midnight when you think about it, where they were already on the planet for a holiday by the time we, the audience, get dropped into the episode. For such a short cameo, the atmosphere is wonderful, and it feels like a living, breathing world. So I really applaud the production team for how it's realised. Donna then gets split off from the Doctor, who is too busy with whatever this thing is. There's a brilliant shift in tone as a woman implores Donna to have her fortune told. The musical cues really tell the viewer that there's more to this fortune teller than we're being led to believe. This uneasiness continues as Donna is guided into oversharing about her past, a wonderful exploitation of her talkative character trait. Again, the music is exceptional here. It's so peaceful, yet there's a real undercurrent of mystery and tension within it, boosted by that incredible variation of the Doctor's leitmotif as Donna's flashbacks. Yeah. 
it starts to feel very unsettling, like Donna is becoming trapped here, the teller pushing deeper and deeper into her psyche. It may have just been the chili I ate while re-watching this, but this scene gave me a really tight feeling in my chest. Everything about it feels off, in a good way. Deep down you know that nothing good will come of this situation and that Donna should get out of there, but she can't. She's in the trap and whatever's lurking behind her is closing in. I really like the flashbacks to Donna's choice, it says a lot about her relationship with her mother. As I've mentioned in previous videos, Sylvia is a very nagging, negative influence in her life, never letting Donna pursue her own ambitions, the companion needing Wilf to counterbalance and support her. This car scene is the epitome of that, because it shows just how different Donna's life would be if she listened to her mother instead of Wilf. Donna's single act of defying Sylvia and going to H.C. Clements led to this wonderful life by making her cross paths with the Doctor, but taking Sylvia's advice instead proves to have disastrous results. It really shows how much Sylvia holds her daughter back by controlling her life and constantly nagging her. So it's great that they zero in on this being the specific moment the timelines change, because it says so much about Donna's free will and sense of self, how she took control of her own life and went on to wonderful things. But things are completely different when she listens to outside influences. Even this change in the timeline is influenced by an outside force, Donna trying her best to fight it but being pushed into it by the Teller and the Time Beetle, her agency taken away. We immediately get right into how different Donna's life is after such a simple decision. Instead of being in the depths of a Torchwood lab fighting a giant spider with her alien kidnapper on her wedding day, she is buying rounds at the pub, flexing her new promotion at the job she chose instead of H.C. Clements. Also, clearly she didn't meet Neris in this timeline, which is a mercy. Thank you, Neris. Donna is just a very normal person doing normal things. I like this because this was the first event where we met her, but she's essentially now just an extra in the background of that episode. I also appreciate that her friend notices there's something on her back which she can't seem to see. We saw at the start that there was something clamouring up there, but we didn't actually see it. The mention of it in this parallel reality is a good way to create the ongoing mystery of the Time Beetle and what it's doing to our protagonist. But then the idea of Donna just being an extra in the Runaway Bride is continued, when everyone goes out to see the Ragnar ship descending on London. I simply adore that there's no music here. In that special, there had been a grandiose score for this moment, but this time, there's only diegetic sound. It creates a firm sense of reality, like this is really happening, an actual event you're seeing from the ground level. It's a cheeky, budget-saving move so they can reuse footage, but I think it's incorporated incredibly well. However, despite Donna being a normal person with no connection to the events unfolding, she still runs towards the danger. I like to think this is her actual self fighting back. There's something about this invasion that doesn't scare her, and I think she almost remembers being involved with it in the Prime Universe, even if she doesn't know that. Donna then stumbles across a cordoned off area filled with emergency services and unit, including that one soldier who became a Centauran mind zombie. I quite like this moment for a number of reasons. Firstly, it keeps that ground level feeling, showing the unit cleanup after the Doctor is gone. Our favourite Time Lord always just dips before it's time to face any aftermath, and it's usually Unit who have to mop everything up. Well, I'll tell them you'll be a little late. So it's great how this scene gives us a glimpse of that aftermath and consequences, especially with how they talk about the Doctor. However, even though he stopped the Ragnos, he paid with his life because Donna wasn't there to stop him. This moment always sends shivers down my spine. That leitmotif from earlier plays as he drops his Sonic and just, uh, it's just perfection in every sense. It's so weighty and surreal. This is a Time Lord who can swagger around defeating aliens with ease and changing their face upon death. They're possibly the single constant in this universe, always ready to swoop in and save people. Well, unless it's Torchwood. But now the Doctor is dead, for good this time. It makes this impossible figure so fallible and mortal. The episode posits that the flooding happened too quickly for the Doctor to regenerate, but I like the idea that he just refused because he felt so much anguish about losing Rose. That whole episode, he was really torn up about Rose because it had just happened, and he was at a very low point. So I wouldn't be surprised if he just gave up on life and didn't want to regenerate after that loss. It's kind of ironic then that Rose comes looking for the Doctor, heartbroken upon news of his death. Just when he'd given up because he could never see her again, she comes back, so close yet so far. It's kind of like Romeo and Juliet, which I imagine ten Rose shippers would have a field day with. 
Rose showing up here is another good way to illustrate how utterly shattered and perverted this timeline is, because it's being constantly hammered home that she's stuck in her own parallel world, but here she is, like she wasn't partners in crime, seconds too late to reunite with the Doctor. I also appreciate that Rose too points out there's something on Donna's back. It wasn't just Alice being weird, I think it makes it even worse for Donna that they can't explain what it is, they don't tell her because they themselves don't know, it's like a perception filter, they know something Thing is there but it's messing with their mind, they can't focus on it to reveal its true nature. Donna gets fired from her job as an aftermath of the Thames being drained, which once again is a good use of the grounded atmosphere. I've always wondered how exactly they sorted out the whole drained Thames thing. I mean, we go from Runaway Bride to Smith and Jones and apparently it's just fine. We never found out how they filled the water back in after it went down to the centre of the earth to hang out with Brendan Fraser. However, this scene tells us that it wasn't an easy fix. It has genuine consequences on London as a setting, causing massive economic losses, Donna's boss not being able to connect with a lot of his clients due to the river being closed off. It's this kind of world building that made the Davies era so tight and interconnected. You always had the feeling that adventures had an actual impact, and moments like these are why. Also, this scene shows how Donna hasn't changed like she would have if she'd met the Doctor. She has that fiery, sassy temper which she uses to shower other people, but in the mean-spirited way she used to, not like she does in Series 4 when she's dressing down villains. She's very spiteful and unlikable, which serves as an illustration of how much her life and personality improved in the actual timeline, how much she needed to meet the Doctor to improve herself. Then, much like the Ragnos star, we see another event take place from the ground view. This time the disappearance of the Royal Hope Hospital was shown in Smith and Jones. Even though, as the audience, we know it went to the moon and the Jadoon ran wild, this time we see it from Earth, having to rely on news reports to be updated about the mystery. Davies always liked to use news reports to create that sense of a wider world and personal impact, but it hits differently here because it's the only window into these adventures, such a small and feeble slice of the bigger picture. It's like how the episode made the Doctor fallible, it also makes the audience fallible by weakening our ability to see wider events, taking that omniscient eye away from us. We're forced to only see what Donna sees, and nothing more, which is a fantastic way to frame the narrative. It's also great that Wilf gets to talk about his aliens, pointing to how these invasions and incursions are getting worse and more frequent. When we met him in Voyage of the Damned, he already believed in all this because of the Sycorax and Ragnos, but here we get to see this belief furthered. You can imagine that during the actual Smith & Jones episode, he would have been similarly sitting there watching the news reports and talking about it being real aliens, so at least the timelines haven't changed him that much. He's still good old Wilf. We get another sense as to how these familiar episodes are being twisted without the Doctor, because this time everyone in the hospital did run out of air and die, since the Doctor wasn't around to stop Miss Finnegan. Hi Finnegan! What the fuck Finnegan Fox Friday? And Martha ended up having to sacrifice herself to save her colleague. Like the Doctor dying, it's a weighty shift in the timeline, such an important figure being wiped before they could have an impact. Martha never gets to go on her own journey in the TARDIS, never becoming the strong woman she became. She still gives her life to save others, like we saw in Smith & Jones, but now her entire life has been ripped away, all because of a simple, unrelated decision Donna made. But if you thought that was bad enough, we also get the bombshell that the entire Sarah Jane Adventures crew was wiped out as well, Sarah Jane filling in the Doctor's role and losing her life as a result. It furthers that sense of hopelessness, killing an entire cast of characters we know and love, all in one news report to illustrate how important the Doctor is to the universe. He's inspired people like Sarah Jane to carry on his work in their own ways, but this episode shows how wrong that can go. It can cost them their lives because it's a dangerous life to lead, kind of a parallel of Donna's observation that the Doctor turned Martha into a soldier, along with Davros's taunting about all the companions being made into warriors for the Doctor. I also think the Sarah Jane Adventures mention is good for the connectedness of the era, because it links the two shows for the first time since Sarah returned in School Reunion. Even though the proper crossover takes place in the finale, this is an acknowledgement that they're out there doing their thing and it primes you for that later appearance when Sarah and Luke do show up. When taking a walk, Donna once again encounters the mysterious Rose, who comes charging out of an alleyway with a blue light and explosion like she's in Back to the Future. This scene is good for all those mounting mysteries because she again calls attention to Donna's back, which more people have apparently noticed since their last meeting. However, the most important aspect of this scene is Rose warning Donna to take a Christmas break, eerily suggesting the noble family shouldn't be in London. 
This gives us a sense as to Rose's knowledge and importance to the story because she, like the audience, has foresight. Because we know this is a reference to Voyage of the Damned, there won't be the Doctor there to stop the Titanic crashing into the planet. This is yet another hint that Rose is this powerful, otherworldly figure because she has this foreknowledge of events to come, just like the Doctor themselves, but we'll get to those parallels a bit later. Her warning is kind of like the Eighth Doctor at the end of the TV movie. Next Christmas, take a vacation, just don't be here. Rose has a greater role to play in the fixing of the timeline, but for now she just has to nudge Donna to where she needs to be for the benefit of reality. If she dies before she's meant to, the whole universe shatters and can't be fixed, so Rose needs Donna to heed her advice more than we think. First prize, luxury weekend break, use it, Donna Noble. Indeed, Donna treats her family to a getaway in the countryside, bringing the debut of Wolf's iconic reindeer antlers, which probably have an entry in TARDIS wiki because basically everything does. I really like the atmosphere when they get up on Christmas morning, it feels so real. It's not some overblown, magical thing, it's just them getting up in the morning as any normal family would. I think it's similar to the pub scene at the beginning, Donna leading this perfectly ordinary life we can all relate to, so vastly different to her exciting life among the stars. However, the maid spots the time beetle as so many others have, only for Donna to actually get a glimpse of it this time, desperately trying to see it in the mirror but not being able to because, well, it's on her back, and that's a pretty difficult place to see. This is a nice advancement because it gives us that peak, just enough to keep the mystery going without it being more of the same vagueness. But before this can be explained, we get a breaking news report revealing the Space Titanic is heading directly for Buckingham Palace, again showing us a key Doctor Who event from the perspective of the ground characters. You could probably criticise their reactions for not being genuine enough, but I actually think it being muted makes it genuine. This is something completely out of the realm of possibility, an event so unbelievable. It has taken away everything they know, all their friends, family, belongings. Their entire life has been uprooted in an instant, so you can't blame them for their disbelief. They're struggling to come to terms with it even being real, and they're shocked that they're alive at all. I have seen criticism that it should have been more than London destroyed, because Voyage of the Damned stated the entire world was under threat. But given that people like Sarah Jane and Martha were involved in the hospital incident, I can headcount in this change as Astrian and Midshipman Frames still getting involved, and at least somewhat minimising the destruction somehow. Similarly to the Thames being drained, the destruction of London has devastating consequences with refugees from the entire south of England, Donna and her family being sent all the way to Leeds because they have no home now. Yeah Donna, I can't blame you, I'm not sure I'd want to go to Leeds either. This is another grounded reality check for the Doctor Universe, a refugee crisis that will always remain relevant no matter what what time period you're in. Without the Doctor around, 7 million people from a first world country are suddenly refugees, forced to relocate and become nobody. No matter where you worked, where you lived, you're just a refugee now, and that's terrifying to think about. One day Donna's life was so normal, and the next she has nothing at all to her name, forced to cram into a tiny house with multiple other families. As everyone knows, this portion of the episode is where Russell decides to roll up his sleeves and say, look I've been writing this show for 4 years and I'm out the door soon, so it's time to write some real hard hitting shit. Mm. He wastes no time with this sadly timeless piece of dialogue. You spin our second family number 29, they miss one mortgage payment, just one, they got booted out. All for you, this is essentially the same as people claiming immigrants are stealing jobs. This fear that citizens are being pushed down to cater to refugees, which is why it's unfortunately always relevant. This episode was written in 2007, but with the ongoing refugee crisis we've been dealing with for many years, it could have easily have come out last year because it will always be an issue and this kind of refugee phobia will always be experienced by a lot of people. The noble's idea of privilege is challenged when they meet the charismatic Rocco Calasanto, a former shopkeep from Sheffield with whom they have to share a house from now on. I really like this because he's a sharp contrast to them. He's all smiles, laughing and joking away, happy to have a house at all, but Donna and Sylvia are shocked at these living conditions. They have always been able to live a comfortable life, but now they're no different to anyone else. Rich or poor, everyone now has to live the same way, but Rocco shows that spirit of make and do of what you have because there's no use complaining or getting all worked up. 
this is just life now, so the quicker you get used to it, the easier it is to cope with this new world. Although Wilf holds out hope that America will save them. In a very good comedic cut in an otherwise very dark episode, it suddenly cuts to 60 million people having dissolved into fat. The adipose scheme relocated to the USA now that England is in crisis. Because Partners in Crime was a very low-key episode, this change in the timeline doesn't need a huge amount of time, but I still like the role it plays. It shows how certain events are destined to take place, but the dominoes lead to it being catastrophic, rather than easily contained like in Partners in Crime. Things seem to be getting infinitely worse now the Doctor is gone, crises becoming so much more deadly as a result of all these factors adding up. It beats the hope out of our characters because they can't catch a break. The world is being bent over and absolutely railed by the Doctorless timeline. There's truly no hope left anymore. As Sylvia says, every day she thinks of someone else they knew that's now dead. This moment between her and Donna is so heartbreaking because they themselves are broken, so worn down by this world that they can't cope. I find it especially sad because Donna for once tries to be optimistic. She holds out hope things can improve and return to normal, that she can salvage a life for her family, but Sylvia keeps shooting her down even when Donna tries to make a simple joke. Then we'll complain. Who's going to listen to us? Donna probably doesn't even believe things will get better either, but she's just trying to comfort her mum and keep spirits up. But it isn't working because Sylvia has no hope for Donna anymore, which is truly sad. Even to the end, Sylvia doesn't see the potential in her daughter. To be honest, I've given up on you. However, as I said, Rocco is an optimistic guy who wants to see the best in the situation, so he leads a sing-song with his family and Wilf, who can't resist one because he's a cheeky little devil. This is a nice ray of sunshine because they can come together and just sing Bohemian Rhapsody, drifting away from the horrors of their lives and taking solace in the company of each other for just a few minutes, even drawing a bit of a smile out of Sylvia. There's a camaraderie here which is very wartime-like, how there's always hope as long as you have each other, as cringe and cliche as that sounds. But because nobody can catch a break, the soldiers outside start to shoot at their exhaust, because of the Atmos crisis spearheaded by the Santarans. Only for one of them to threaten Donna after seeing something on her back. Now, I'm not sure if it's simply because the episode is structured around seeing these events through Donna's eyes and not much else, but every time someone seems to see the time beat on her back, it's during one of these drastically altered events. Almost like it becomes more visible in these moments the point in the timeline is being changed. It's probably just because these events are the bulk of the episode, but if these appearances are the intention, it works really well in my opinion. I also like Wolf standing up for Donna and dressing down the soldier for threatening her. He's always been fiercely supportive of her, so it's nice to see him fight like this. Especially because he himself was a soldier, so knows it's not very soldier-like to threaten an unarmed civilian. Or, well, depending on the war and the countries involved, sometimes it is very soldier-like, but I won't get into that right now. However, Donna is drawn to a flash of light down the road, now knowing what, or who, that means. Indeed, she once again meets Rose, who tells her all about the Atmos Crisis. I actually really like that Britain isn't as affected as the rest of the world because the Titanic disaster led to fewer cars and petrol. It's another dramatic shift in the world, but a strangely positive one in terms of the effect on Donna and her family. We saw that they were directly in the eye of the storm during the actual event, but in this timeline they're so distant, a world away from it all. Much like the hospital, the universe fills in the gaps by having the Torchwood team solve the Santaran stratagem, Gwen and Yanto becoming the next two familiar faces to die, whilst Captain Captain Jack becomes a prisoner on the Santaran homeworld. Not only does it once again introduce a spin-off team we see in the finale, but it's also another way to show the cost of all of this. We've had Sarah Jane and her team die, Martha, the Doctor, and now Captain Jack and Torchwood. There's no one left anymore except for Rose and Donna. They're the last hope because the Doctor and all his allies have been burned up to keep this horrible timeline ticking along. It really highlights how many people die when the Doctor isn't there, so much pain and suffering as others are forced to take his place for the greater good. These people we know so well being sacrificed in episodes we've already seen play out just fine. Rose explains everything to Donna, who the Doctor is and that he should have been there to stop everything. This is a great exchange because it ultimately sees Donna question her own identity. She's seeing all this destruction and horror happening across the world and she has no idea why Rose keeps coming to her. 
Donna doesn't know what she's capable of because she listened to Sylvia for her timeline change in choice. She allows Sylvia to control her identity so she considers herself nobody. It's probably the lowest point we ever see Donna in throughout her time in the show. She's tired and dead inside with no optimism or confidence anymore, but Rose is the opposite of Sylvia, knowing what Donna is capable of and how she's important. Donna Noble, you're the most important woman in the whole of creation. Now, I'm not a fan of Dr. Two companions becoming the most significant people in the universe, but this isn't really saying Donna herself is the most important. Well, the finale does, but that's a different story. No, this is simply stating that the Doctor's companion is the most important person because they're the one who keeps the Time Lord alive and going. The Doctor died that night under the Thames because there was no companion, so like Donna said at the end of that episode, the Doctor needs someone. I also think that Rose acts quite Doctor-like during this scene, even copying some of his mannerisms. This goes to show how much of an impact he had on her. We even had moments in series 2 where she tried to act like him, which ultimately doomed her to begin with. However, this time it's different because she's been hardened by a time away and all that travelling through dimensions. She's seen some awful things and developed into a Doctor-like character more naturally now, which make her warnings about something coming across the stars and Donna's death really chilling. The episode already showed she has foresight, so you know her warnings are serious, and it makes you worry a lot about what's coming. And because their universe is slightly ahead of ours, she can see where she needs to go in our universe to stop everything unravelling. Rocco, ever the optimist, acts all excited about him and his family leaving because there's a new law sending foreigners to labour camps. I love that Donna is naive to this, but Wilf knows, sharing that telling, sombre look with Rocco, both knowing the truth. This is hands down the darkest scene in Doctor Who's entire history, the most sobering and downright ugly the show has ever gotten. The timeline has been so utterly destroyed that our own country is making concentration camps to cult undesirables. The country was beaten into the ground that much and the results speak for themselves. It runs similar to the refugee phobia I mentioned earlier, attacking the easy targets. It's also a lot like Midnight, persecuting the outsiders. This whole us versus them viewpoint, turning to tribalism out of desperation. Without the Doctor, the human race gives in to its disgusting dark side, and I don't think anyone can watch the scene and not feel distraught. Such a simple choice of which way to turn on a road has led to the deaths of hundreds of millions and literal concentration camps in England. There's no doubt that this is the darkest timeline, and it's not even like these camps are run by Daleks or anything like that. It's all humanity acting on its own accord, which is the scariest part about it. How a Western superpower in the 21st century could officially make concentration camps legal and socially acceptable. It's soul crushing, perfect dystopian fiction. Donna isn't able to get a job and resigns herself to failure, admitting Sylvia was right, she's a disappointment who never worked hard enough at school and will never accomplish anything, to which her mother simply replies, yeah, not even looking at her daughter. This is another heartbreaking moment, because it's Sylvia still refusing to hold any kind of hope for her daughter, completely giving up on her despite family being the only thing left. They need to hold on to each other and be supportive, but she rejects Donna. Ironically, all of this happened because of Sylvia, but that doesn't change the sadness of the moment. I also think this is a parallel of their scene together in Partners in Crime, where Sylvia blasted Donna for being unemployed. Donna's simply sitting there in silence as it happened. However, this time, Sylvia doesn't even nag her anymore. She just sits numb and broken without offering any support. Even when she was shouting at Donna in that opening episode, it was out of a desire for Donna to make something out of herself. But here, there's absolutely nothing. No intent to help, just disappointment and apathy which is so sad. Again, like that other scene, she goes to her dear old granddad for support as he sits looking through his old telescope. However, this time it's different because he can't seem to see anything. In Partners in Crime, he was looking up at Venus and being so optimistic about space travel, hoping to jig about with all those aliens. But this time it's emotional because he doesn't even have that hope anymore, not able to look at the stars because they're starting to go out. This moment is incredible, all those billions and billions of stars blinking out of existence. I know this is supposed to be because of the reality bomb or whatever, but I prefer to think it's because the Doctor isn't there to save all these alien civilizations anymore. Not only is the Earth dying without him, the entire universe is, and this scene is really good for showing that, everything just disappearing for good. You understand why this is the final catalyst for Donna going with Rose, because it's another prediction coming true, like the Christmas break. So Donna knows she has to accept her death to stop all this horror. 
The stars were all Wolf had to cling on to, but now they're dying. He can't even look up and dream anymore. And when Wilfred Mott isn't holding out hope, you know the end times are truly here. Rose then takes Donna to a unit warehouse where the TARDIS is hooked up to machines. The former companion again acts like the Doctor with techno babble and refusing salutes, even watching gleefully as Donna reacts to the machine being bigger on the inside and explaining it all to her, filling in for the Time Lord again in a nice way. However, this makes me wonder, is Donna the first companion to react twice to the size of the TARDIS? Speaking of, I do adore how the TARDIS looks in this episode. We saw it in a similar state in Rise of the Cybermen when it was in Pete's world, but it's so much more desolate and lifeless here, which I really love. Without the Doctor, the TARDIS has no purpose, it's just an abandoned machine without a pilot. The way it's shot communicates that absence well because we're so used to it being lit up and lively, it's like it has no soul anymore. However, as punishment for Donna daring to ask about Ten Rose, Rose shows her the mysterious creature on her back. This scene is so disorienting as she struggles to comprehend her importance and how this beetle thing is affecting her life. I don't even mind that the beetle looks a bit naff because it's about the intent of the scene, and this intent is achieved well, finally understanding everything, how exactly Donna's life was changed. I think everyone can easily relate to Donna's emotions here. Imagine if tomorrow night some random woman showed up and told you a beetle was riding your back to twist your timeline, and that you're actually supposed to be one of the most important people in existence. You can't tell me you'd handle that with ease. It would be a massive shock to the system, so I feel as though Donna's reaction is very realistic. There's a brilliant suit-up scene as Rose lays out the plan for Donna to travel back in time and repair the timeline. It all feels very unit, like an actual sci-fi movie with all this tech in this plan. Here they've used the TARDIS to create their own makeshift time machine. I just love how DIY and makeshift this setup is. It doesn't feel official or like some huge project, it's just a bunch of mirrors and some cables going into a police box. Something rudimentary I think the Doctor would be proud of, and so it's a good use of unit. It's also great that Donna has that hero moment of realising the reason she needs to die. She thought she was a nobody, but now she knows that she's sacrificing herself so the real Donna can become that brilliant person travelling with the Doctor. It's a wonderful moment that lifts your spirits as a viewer, reassuring you that everything will be okay. But then, because Russell doesn't let you have nice things, Rose's reaction immediately cuts that good feeling short, because Donna really does have to die. I think it's a good touch that Donna ends up in the wrong place, half a mile away from where she should be, adding so many stakes to the situation along with being quite in line with the Doctor's own time travelling. This isn't Hillview Road. I bet it isn't even South Croydon. The editing here is sublime because it recalls that sequence from the opening. We have a direct scene to compare the length of time Donna has to stop herself. Donna is just a normal person like us who can't spontaneously sprint half a mile in four minutes, so it feels like she's going to fail. But she steps out in front of a lorry and lets herself die to create a traffic jam, playing some 4D chess with causality. Again, the music is brilliant, using the rueful fate of Donna Noble as the timeline is triumphantly restored through such tragic means. Even though you know this is meant to happen, it's still really sad to experience, and I think there are some parallels to Father's Day back in Series 1, where Pete also had to run out in front of a car and die to repair time itself, Rose being there for them both in their dying moments. People say there was this girl, and she sat with Pete while he was dying, never found out who she was. Now that all the timeline shenanigans are fixed, Donna returns to the prime timeline and I really like the reaction of the fortune teller, who is terrified of Donna's strength and what she'll become. After the series 4 finale, we have the hindsight of knowing this future is the first and last human Time Lord hybrid, but it's such a good subtle piece of foreshadowing here, hinting at this untapped power and destiny. The Doctor then swaggers in without a care in the world, obviously only having been away for like 5 minutes, while she went on this multi-year parallel world night Nightmare. And yes, before you point it out, I know the Doctor mentions the beat of this part of the Trickster's Brigade of Sarah Jane Adventures in for me, so you don't need to comment that. Donna recalls Rose's warning of every world facing the darkness, and I love how serious the Doctor gets as he slowly realises it's Rose, this old companion he felt so strongly for and thought he'd never see again. The look of fear on his face is absolutely incredible, the utopia edit of all the strange strange creatures slowly fading in until Donna drops the bombshell of the message Rose gave her. 
bad wolf. Oh boy, what a phenomenal ending to this episode. As soon as this happens, you know sh** is about to go down. One of my favourite Series 4 moments is the pair rushing outside and seeing Bad Wolf on literally everything. Even the TARDIS itself, which is bright red inside, like in Sound of Drums. Now, even if you hadn't seen Series 1, this revelation has such gravitas. A really earth-shattering moment. It's an incredible final scene, all culminating in this spine-chilling line. What's Bad Wolf? It's the end of the universe. Now, I know this is Doctor Who being Doctor Who and over-exaggerating, but the Doctor isn't really lying. Rose should be permanently trapped in her parallel world. It's physically impossible to travel across dimensions. The last time it was possible, Daleks and Simon crossed over and wreaked havoc. So if this interdimensional travel is possible, and even regular humans can do it, what else can? The walls of the universe being so thin last time was a universal threat, so you can't blame him for fearing the worst. As we hit the biggest finale on planet Earth. Whilst editing this video, I thought of a few more points, but couldn't find anywhere to easily slot them in, so I just thought I'd add them here before I wrap up. Turn left kind of answers Joan's implication at the end of Family of Blood, where she suggested all the deaths in that story were the Doctor's fault for choosing to hide in that village. There has always been this lingering question of whether the Doctor causes or prevents death. So this story shows how many people die without the Time Lord around feeding into the character's deep guilt and sense of responsibility. They're literally carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. But he doesn't have an answer, and, and I think inevitably he's tortured by his own responsibility. Donna goes on a great character journey because she comes into her own and takes her life into her own hands. Throughout the first half of the episode, she's very unlikable and doesn't have much agency, but the experiences shape her and transform her into a capable hero who understands her worth as a person. Standing on her own two feet, essentially a different path for the character journey she goes through in series four. This is Donna's episode. This is where as a character, and I think as, in terms of Catherine's performance, it's, it's her coming of age almost. Davies initially planned to explain how events like the Shakespeare Code were fixed through the use of unit time commandos, but instead the reason for these kinds of events not happening are because of the trickster or the time beetle stopping it themselves to maintain the timeline. Because the Doctor, Jack and Martha all die in this episode, it nullifies the Master's rise to power because Utopia never takes place. It's noticeable in the Smith and Jones scene because Oliver doesn't mention Mr. Saxon, along with crediting the real heroes rather than trying to take take the credit for himself as he did at the end of the episode. I represented the human race. I told them, you can't do that. I said... A colleague of mine gave me the last oxygen tank, Martha, and my Martha Jones. Sylvia is thoroughly unlikable in this episode, and it makes you understand why Donna was the way she was in Runaway Bride, because her mother has not done a good job raising her. Expanded media has claimed Wolf never raised his voice at Sylvia when she was growing up, so she probably thinks that she can treat Donna badly without understanding how negatively that will affect her daughter, which really explains so much about Donna's characterisation. I suppose I've always been a disappointment. Lastly, there's so much more to be said about the authoritarian dystopia implied with the labour camps, but I think it's a topic I may return to in the future to make a proper fleshed out video essay about, rather than making this review even longer than it already is. Turn Left is an absolutely perfect episode of Doctor Who. Seriously, after the magnificence of the library two-parter and Midnight, you'd be forgiven for expecting this episode to fall a bit short. But it doesn't, not even in the slightest. It takes the Doctor away from the story, but crafts such an interesting and gripping story around that absence. It feels like one of those rare episodes that could be its own feature-length movie, thanks to this scintillating tale of timelines gone completely wrong from a single decision. This great example of the butterfly effect. It goes without saying, but Catherine Tate is utterly brilliant as Donna, proving to any doubters once and for all that she isn't just sarcastic comic relief. She's capable of so much more with this dramatic range, showing how significantly Donna changed once she met the Doctor. Murray Gold's score adds so much to the story, and I really respect how they managed to craft such a compelling story as an excuse to reuse existing footage to save money, weaving those previous episodes in fantastically and killing off so many familiar Doctor Who characters to prove how important the titular character is. The spiral into a crushing, realistic, dystopian nightmare world is executed flawlessly, and you know Davies loved the world he created, because he would draw on similar concepts for his show years and years. 
I don't think it's any surprise that I'm giving Turn Left a dazzling S rank on the Series 4 tier list. From the very first minute until the very last, you remain gripped and entranced by the episode. Every aspect is incredible. It's also the perfect way to both explain Rose's mysterious cameos whilst also leading perfectly into the blockbuster finale. Considering the episodes it was sandwiched by, Turn Left could have easily fallen short, but it manages to thrive in its experimental nature and tell a dark and captivating Doctor Who story, exploring the butterfly effect and taking it to the extreme. Turn Left is an episode you're never likely to forget, and well, I'll see you next time at the end of the universe. And I'd just like to give a very special thank you to my Gold Level patrons. Alex Marston, Calvin, Daniel Shilato, Franz Horn aka Lime Vortex, John, Ross, Stephanie Ever Miller, and William Jewell. Thank you so much for your support.